In our first reading, the prophet Isaiah speaks the words that Jesus will fulfill. The Lord God has given me a well-trained tongue that I might know how to speak to the weary, a word that will rouse them. How many are the things that weary us in these days? And all the drama around pandemic and politics, the age-old challenges of co-workers and friends, family, romantic endeavors. We tire of scandal in the church and in the world. We're wearied by sin and addiction and failure and shame. The spirit of the world grates on our nerves. Maybe the things that bother us most are the things that seem avoidable, preventable. Imagine all the things that weary Jesus. How much of what goes wrong in our hearts, in our lives, in our world could be prevented simply by the love of Jesus? It's not so complicated. Jesus sums it all up in a single word, love. So it is simple, but we complicate it and make it more difficult because we're small and weak creatures. We're selfish. The problem is not that people don't want love. Everybody wants love. Pretty much everybody in the world, if you ask them, would say, yes, I want that. The problem is that we have a kind of blindness. We have difficulty seeing the important difference between selfish, selfless love and selfishness. We hear those two things and they seem obvious enough which one is which. Selfless love and selfishness. We really are that weak that we have a kind of blindness and inability to see the difference. Considering this provides a helpful lens for us to consider the scriptures that we're going to encounter throughout this week. What does real selfless love look like? Look at our second reading from Philippians. Though he was in the form of God, Jesus did not grasp for power or self-interest. Rather, he empties himself like a human slave, humbling himself in obedience to the Father, so that the Father would be glorified. Jesus pours himself out in love for us and for the Father. The age-old problem of sin starts with grasping at self-interest and abandoning God's voice. Mary of Bethany lavishes Jesus with an entire jar of expensive oil that really should have been saved for her future spouse. Jesus receives it with gratitude as a preemptive anointing before his death, and he holds her up as an example to show all of us how to love without counting the cost. Something like 300 days wages? Imagine if somebody poured something out all over your head, all over your body, that cost $50,000. Jesus would have smelled like that stuff for a month. It's very potent stuff. He wasn't going to live that long. Notice that Judas and some of the others, they have a disproportionate response, so selfish that it leads them to start plotting against Jesus. Their hearts are set on power. Their hearts are set on greed. Their hearts are set on the love of money. All of these things are about self-interest. It's the root of all evil, according to the Scriptures. Not money, the love of money. What's the love of money about? It's about love of self. It's about grasping at power and control. Consider St. Peter. I love Peter. He wants to be able to live with a virtuous, self-forgetting love. He wants to be able to risk it all out of pure and zealous fidelity to Jesus. Even if it should mean his life. His heart's all the way in it, but he's unable to follow through with the vow that he makes to Jesus. Even though all should have their faith shaken, mine will not be. Even though I should have to die with you, I will not deny you. It says they all spoke similarly. How many of them stand at the cross at the end of the day? One. These are the same ones who would be invited to the troubling and difficult but intensely intimate 
Garden of Gethsemane. They want to be there for Jesus, but are unable to. As Jesus says it, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. It's like Jesus is kind of like, in a way, maybe sort of telling them, like, it's okay. Like, I know that your heart's here. It's just that you're human. Your heart's in it. Your mind's in it. You're trying to do it. You're just failing. You're just falling short. Often enough, our hearts are in the right place. We want to follow Jesus closely and never abandon him or his teachings. But in our weakness, we fail. Here we need to put aside our pride and ask God for the grace we need to persevere. We simply cannot love the way Jesus calls us to on our own strength. It's important to consider this during this Holy Week. The way that we want to enter into this week, the way that we want to give Jesus everything in this week, the way that we want to make time for him and pay attention to him, you cannot do it on your own strength. I can't do it on my own strength. The place to enter into Holy Week is in a disposition of humility. It's in admitting our need for Jesus, asking Him for the grace, asking Our Lady to accompany us into this holiest of weeks. As our story continues to unfold, it is again Judas who, with a sign of love and respect, a kiss, and the title, Rabbi, betrays our Lord. Peter, too, continues to follow, but at a distance warming himself by the fire with the guards, all more examples of self-concern. Meanwhile, Jesus is being arrested, accused by bogus witnesses, and beaten, all while saying nothing, even though he could have easily schooled them all. We have an incredible opportunity that lays before us in this week is to attend the school of Christian charity, to see what the love of Jesus really looks like. In these days we have so many beautiful celebrations to come and to contemplate his life and his death and his resurrection. To come together to build each other up. It's asked today out of humility and our poverty for Jesus to teach us how to love.